I am. Yeah. So, uh, we can go ahead and get kicked off here. So, um, so, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd like, before I introduce our speaker and kind of kick things off, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining uh, today's live demo series. Um, and just as a note, we will reserve time at the end of today's presentation for Q and A. So if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to put those in the WebEx chat and we'll make sure to, to spend a few minutes on that at the end. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Doug Dooley, who will be our presenter today. Doug? All right, thanks Richard. And Richard will also be a presenter today a little bit later when we do the live demo. So this is a nice little tag team. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna be talking about this topic around full stack application attacks. I think this is gonna be an interesting topic that we're gonna keep seeing for the next five to 10 years. Um, and so it's really about analyzing data breaches that have been happening on modern software uh, which looks a little bit different than if you've been in the security industry for a few years, um, how it's sort of evolved. So first of all, this concept of modern is sort of relative based on time. So let's start to define and put some, put some, uh, some definition around what we mean by modern. So um, if you look at what a lot of uh, software has uh, evolved into, going back into sort of 1991, 1999 timeframe, is this sort of concept of a web application, whether it's web 1.0 or web 2.0 application, it really grew up out of the corporate data center um, using, at that time, the state-of-the-art application stack, which was a combination of leveraging SQL databases, uh, or relational databases that were heavily SQL-based, um, and then, of course, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP-style stack, software stack that, again, resided in a private data center and then egressing out into the public internet. Um, and there were a lot of technologies that grew out of that architecture from a security perspective. Um, but we started to make a transition around 2006, 2007, and 2008. The big things that changed in that era were really the introduction of public cloud services with you know, Amazon launching these three. Um, also the introduction of the iPhone, which eventually led to the app stores, uh, both Google and Apple sort of having the dominant app stores, um, and this sort of app economy. So this kind of very personalized, locally rendered application that was rendered on mobile devices, servicing heavily out of cloud services. That's sort of the transition period that we entered into how software architecture fundamentally changed from that kind of private data center, lockdown, egress, ingress model of trust and untrust to natively being in the cloud, natively being on the internet. And then more recently in the last, let's call it six to seven years, really we're seeing the modern software stack where the cloud services in the public cloud, there's still, still a lot of debate during the transition period whether uh, a private data center could really compete uh, with what was happening with the innovation and development that was happening in the public cloud and also this app economy of apps constantly being updated on a typically you know, weekly basis. Uh, so that feature velocity that grew out of the app economy and the cloud services that evolved sort of in this current era really sort of changed the game of how the architectures of applications were being built. And as a result, even in the web, the web finally went through a massive reboot with single page applications with these new JavaScript frameworks coming out, rendering web apps to operate more like mobile apps in the way that they perform, they scaled, and also the way you would have to go about trying to secure them. So this is our definition of modern software with that modern stack and how that architecture has changed and forced application security to also change. So when we look at full stack application attack vectors, these are the three vectors that are commonly under attack from a, a modern hacker going for a, a creating a data breach. Um, so on the first layer is sort of that client user experience layer, whether it be mobile, or web and specifically sort of these single page applications, these modern web applications. We go one step deeper into those client layer applications and what we're gonna find is dozens of API services, sometimes natively owned by the publisher of the app itself, but often leveraging third parties that come from SDK services, open source services, or a variety of other microservices that enhance the application. So it's a mix of first party and third party APIs typically done with REST, but increasingly starting to use things like GraphQL. And then if you go below those APIs, they're now being hosted heavily in the public cloud, specifically with technologies 
that um, we haven't ever seen in the private cloud or in the private data center. So things like cloud functions, serverless, this different kind of mesh microservices architecture, it really makes the deconstruction of how an app works and all the subcomponents of it much more complicated. And as a result, the attackers are taking advantage of all these new attack vectors. So I want to talk a little bit about the latest data breach incident report that Verizon uh, continues to put out on an annualized basis. This has become, at least in security, one of the hallmark uh, reports that we all look forward to uh, from an analyzed basis just to see where we are as an industry. Well, web applications continue to be the number one uh, hacking vector for how data breaches occur. Um, more data breaches happen through a web app than almost anything else. And then also what's interesting or not interesting is that the way you exploit that web application oftentimes is compromising user credentials, tokens, you know, information that really uh, goes after the identity of that user. Um, but what I think is also interesting is if you were in security over the last 15 years, you know, taking advantage of command shell once you exploit that client layer or taking advantage of weaknesses in fuzzing database calls, particularly around SQL injection, that has really fallen off a cliff. It doesn't mean it's not important and relevant, but if you're looking at just last year's number of attacks, how far this two, these two areas used to be so prominent in the way you would hack an application to now becoming sort of diminutive in, 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 in relative terms. Also, what, what's worth learning from last year's uh, data breach incident report is that hacking continues to be the number one way on how a data breach occurs, and that's usually from an external attacker. Um, what's also interesting that's been floating around, but, but also maybe not interesting, is the social engineering part. An attacker often wants to compromise the weakest link in a system, and humans tend to be the weakest link in the system. We're emotional, we can be baited in with fear, with greed, lots of different techniques to get us to do something silly or unusual to compromise our identity or compromise our credentials. That really is the key for that attacker to get to through the first stage of what they're going for. But what's the most interesting I find on this report is that in the category of errors, uh, we're going to see just in a second, misconfiguration specifically has now risen almost to the level of social attacks um, for why data breaches occur. So if you zoom in a little bit on all the subcategories of errors, this is the first year misconfiguration has overtaken the number one position of why people are being data breached. And I can tell you that our view here at Data Theorem is that developers have so much power in the current way applications are being constructed, whether it's a single page application or a mobile application, the ability to spin up massive amounts of global infrastructure with just a few lines of code calling API services and spinning out tons of serverless uh, infrastructure. This is where if you don't have a security mindset as you're building your application, uh, a simple error can occur. And frankly, it's not always the developer's fault. There's so many places where a misconfiguration could occur, particularly as you're pushing out new features on a daily, weekly basis. And so again, it's not shocking this has happened, but look at the difference between 2018 and 2019 on how much this has become a problem. So this is sort of a simplistic and apologize for the cliche uh, iceberg image, but it's, it's, it does illustrate the point that we're going to go for, which is what does the modern attack often look like? The modern attack is really focused on those three layers, that user experience layer, the data transport layer that's now found at API, no longer the corporate network. It's really the APIs that matter. Uh, and then the fundamental building blocks where the persistent storage ex exists, whether it's in the form of a database or a form of simple storage. Um, these are the three layers that an attacker is looking to exploit. So first and foremost, they're often trying to harvest that user's credentials, right? Trying to get the token, trying to get password information, session information. From there, if they're successful at compromising or socially engineering that user experience, then they go and go to the next layer, which is really the data transport. Our, our assertion is in the last two years, if a business has a headline of losing more than a million records, 90% of the time, an API was involved. This is really where the massive amounts of data is being transported in the modern era with modern software. So once again, getting that token, punching through that API in order to get to the underlying infrastructure, which is inherently hosted on the internet, right, with public cloud services. 
And if you can compromise something that's misconfigured in the storage layer or the database layer, then the attacker tends to be very successful in their extraction of information that they, they can often monetize or leverage to their benefit. So how do we back up these assertions? Well, for us in the security industry, it's fairly easy. Just look at the headlines. If you just read the news um, and you look at the attorney general's filing lawsuits against companies, um, you're often seeing a headline typically on a monthly basis, sometimes multiple times a month, of different companies being breached. And uh, all the ones here on the right-hand side are, are very focused on API data breaches in the multi-million records, but we're actually gonna focus the one, the, uh, uh, for this presentation, the three on the left, so Capital One, 63 Red, and BHIN. So what are these real-world examples teaching us about uh, a modern attack? Um, first of all, let's talk about Capital One. This was a full-stack application attack from a very skilled attacker named Paige Thompson. She was able to take advantage of the open source web application firewall that Capital One was using to front end their applications um, hosted in Amazon. And from that exploit, when she was able to break through that kind of web layer of the WAF, she was then able to successfully launch an SSRF server side request forgery attack to again, take advantage of the backend service of, that, of those APIs. From there, she was then able to unearth a metadata service, sort of a legacy version of the metadata service that Amazon has running inside of an EC2 instance. From that, she was able to figure out all the most interesting sources of data she could get her hands on. And she did it, and she was successful. This was a full stack application attack, very modern style approach. Um, she ended up, for some reason, disclosing it publicly and sort of embarrassing Capital One and, and uh, law enforcement caught up to her. Um, but she could have maybe not said anything and monetized it in the dark web, and that's probably the more common pattern. But I think the unusual thing here is that she kind of did it old school and uh, bragged about um, her, her um, very successful exploit. Next company to look at is 63 Red. This is um, essentially a, a Yelp for conservatives is, is one of the ways it's been described. Uh, but they built a JavaScript React native application. Uh, they, I think they outsourced that development of those JavaScript React apps. Uh, they then converted those apps into uh, apps that could get published on the app stores of both Apple and Google. And someone did a little bit of security research and figured out there were embedded passwords inside this JavaScript React uh, app. And so that's a big no-no in security to ever embed passwords. You know, so again, you exploit the client layer, you harvest uh, a credential or a password, and from that password, they'll also be able, able to unearth some shadow APIs, maybe APIs that weren't well known or publicly published, but then to go and leverage that password to get through that API, uh, but then to take advantage of pulling out storage out of that app. And of course, the big fear was that users who might not want to be known, their political affiliations were being disclosed as a result of that exploit. And then the last example here of this full stack application attack is with an Indian payments app that is uh, very like, let's say PayPal for, for India, um, heavily Android app user base. They had an embedded token inside the Android app that then was harvested out. Uh, from that, they could exploit the API using that token um, to punch through that app. It's essentially like a toxic token to get through the API layer. And then they had a second flaw in the design of their application. They actually had an S3 bucket, uh, a storage bucket, hosted on the internet without authentication protection. That's typically a big no-no, particularly because there were seven million records of their customers with uh, driver's license information, bank account information, and of, of course, a, lot, a variety of PII information. And so to lose seven million records in this form from an Android payments app with an open S3 bucket, um, I would like to say this is never going to happen again, but this appears to become a common pattern that we're seeing in a modern attack you know, using the sort of full stack application style uh, breach. So with that, we're going to shift to talking about how can a company prevent themselves from, from having this occur to them or do put in measures where maybe technology can be a, a solution to avoiding this kind of full stack attack. Um, 